try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right, there we are. It's good to be in the house of God today and uh, just worship. Worship was amazing, wasn't it? I want to say hi to you, but I also want to say hi to our online viewers and cable viewers. Can we give them a big hand as they join us? We want to know that we're at Church Alive and we're glad you're watching. Um, we're in a series entitled Growing Deeper. If you uh, have been here for the first two installments, would you raise your hand if you've been here? Cool. If you haven't, I just want to encourage you to uh, check out those messages online. You can go to YouTube or our website, either one of those. They're really building upon each other. The series is entitled Growing Deeper. And the idea is that sometimes we've got, to, in order to grow in our relationship with God and each other, we've got to get out of the shallows. There's a tendency for us to kind of go, you know, just put our toe in the water, sometimes ankle deep. And a lot of times we're just staying there. We're wondering why things aren't going so good for us. And it's because we need to go deep to grow deep. Can I have an amen? amen. And so in the first kind of couple of weeks, last week we talked about kind of how to have next level relationships. Like what are the characteristics, attributes, qualities that we should see in our friendships, in our relationships with other people. And we studied the life of uh, Jonathan and a, uh, just a tremendous uh, man of God in 1 Samuel 14 and his armor bearer and how two people really could change the world, just what can happen with two people in a godly relationship. And so if you want to learn how to differentiate some of the friendships you have from your wor in, the, in, the, in the world that you're in today and the sphere of influence that you have today and kind of weed out the, the best ones and, and the bad ones, uh, this will be a great message for you. But the, the week that preceded that, week one, talked about a problem that is pervasive, and that is the problem of isolation. That actually the enemy of your soul, you may not believe this, you don't have to, that's okay, I don't care, I believe it, I think it's, I'm doing my best to give you what I think I see from the scriptures, but the enemy works really hard to pick us off. He's trying to kind of get us away from the pack, get us isolated, not necessarily insulated. Those are mutually exclusive terms. Sometimes we have to intentionally insulate ourselves from certain people for those kind of God moments, those faith decisions, those big faith moments in our life. But insulation versus isolation, isolation is bad for us. It can lead us in really, really rough shape. And so we talked about the problem of isolation. Today I want to deal with kind of really what God wanted. The solution is actually the opposite of isolation. It's intimacy. And so we're going to talk about kind of the solution to growth. If you're taking notes, you can kind of open up your worship guide. You'll see there's no normal worship kind of uh, guide in there this morning. It's kind of, you can write down what you want to write down because this is going to be a fast and furious message. This is going to be like a FedEx commercial. You remember that FedEx commercial? And then the end. So that's how this is going to go, okay? Because I want to give maximum time for us to interact at the end of the service today. We live in a world, though, that I think you would agree is kind of uh, lives on the surface. It's actually, there's a lot of stuff that conditions us to stay on the surface of our life. Fake, somewhat, somewhat feigned facades of friendships. Um, our whole world is kind of conditioned us this way. A lot of stuff fake in our life. And, and this is, I'm not, partic I'm not picking on a particular gender or anything like that, but there's fake nails. You know what I mean? Something, okay, we'll switch back to the other gender. Fake teeth. You know what I mean? We've got fake body parts. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I mean, we're taking stuff, ladies, out of this part of us, and we're putting it in this part of us, and we're calling it attractive. <laughs> I actually think that those body parts, if we keep doing that, are going to get mixed up. And we're going to find ourselves sitting on our, you know what I mean? I don't know. It's just things can get really messy as we go forward. We live in a fake world. We go to work, and you've heard the phrase where it's kind of like fake it till you make it, right? You know, I know a guy that, a uh, college student, he was kind of playing a prank on his family. And so he pretended he got married and had kids. And so he, he, got a, he hired a fake family to take Christmas pictures with him and send it out you know, to his family, just freaked him out. There's just this preoccupation with living this fake world. But how many know that if we're honest and we do a little inventory of ourselves, we kind of step back and uh, look at our lives, fake is exhausting. Fake is exhausting. You know, when we're not real, it, it's really, really draining. It's really draining. And so we believe that God wants you, whether we're, you, when you look at his word and just as a value at Connect, that God wants you to be in real, authentic relationships with people. And it's not an overnight thing, which we'll talk about and have continued to talk about. It's a process. 
life change can happen in a process, in a journey, in relationships. A heart change can happen in a moment, in a second. But we need to be a part of this process. And real relationships are built, not bought. You have to make an investment in them. And if you make incremental investments in those relationships, there can be literally amazing returns. In fact, I'll prove it to you in a little while. I think it actually can yield supernatural returns in our life. So to understand this, first, I want you to just write this particular phrase down if you're taking notes. God builds his kingdom relationally. God builds his kingdom relationally. If you look through the lens of scripture, you will see the the view of the world is through relationships from God's eyes. He even uses terms like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is this is actually depicting or illustrating to us that he sees things through relationship upon relationship upon relationship. Those that love their God will, will be blessed a thousand generations, it says. So God is really a relational God because he knows The greatest potential is there for good or for evil. The biggest problems in your life that you face today are in the relational realm, relational um, windshield, how you see the world, your relational mindset. People's hurts, sure, they're external. People have scars and, and they've been beaten up physically, but most of our real pain is about rejection, is it about, it's about, you know, relational hurts, it's about insecurities, it's about trust that's been broken and things of those, na- of that nature. And the interpretation of that pain leads to masks, masks that lead us to independence, and independence that leads us to a painful, vulnerable place of isolation. And that's where the enemy tries to come in and pounce us and convince us that people hurt. And you know what? They do. But people also heal. You know what? They do. People heal. And so people in and out of the church are experiencing relationship breakdown and bankruptcy and problems of all different types. And so if you look at, you know, your past, if you look at the things that keep you up in the night, it's usually not the stress of an abundance of activity. I wish I had time to tell you a couple stories about this, but most people's stress is not because I'm busy, 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 busy. Most, that's not what's keeping us up at night. That's actually what's making us go to bed at night. Is, is, is a lot of activity. What wakes us up in the night is the issues of the heart. It's issues of relationships. It's a, it's a breach. It's a, it's a breakdown. It's a fear. It's, and it's always connected somehow to people. It's, it's, no, it's no different in my profession. In my profession, just to just kind of highlight some of the weaknesses in my profession, 95, 90% excuse me, of all pastors are lonely. 78% of pastors have no close friends. 77% of pastors say they don't have a good marriage. That's why we do things at Connect to try to not just get us connected, but even get leaders and pastors connected as we're doing at Relate on September 27th. If you want to get involved in that, you want to help people and really just shore up shepherds and leaders, that's a great thing for you. But God builds his kingdom relationally, and and the enemy pays attention to that better than we do, and so he works overtime to try to destroy relationships at the core, at the root. He knows something that a lot of times we don't see. There's a text in Genesis 1, and I'm going to highlight Two portions of this text. And the first part would be a little confusing at first. The second part will make it make sense. But I want you to see in this text that God is trying to reproduce through seed, multiply and grow through seed. You see it in living, all living things, and you also see it in human relationships. Because God is a God who likes to multiply things in the context of relationships. In fact, in Genesis 1, verse 11, it says, God said this. Are you guys enjoying this so far? Yes. It says, let the land produce. Everybody say produce. God wants to see things produce, productive, vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it. According to their various kinds, and it was so, the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. God saw that it was good. Then in verse 27 and 28, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and have dominion over it or subdue it. So here's what's going on here. This is kind of like a principle of multiplication. All, God created a system where all things multiply. Everything in God's system is meant to produce, to reproduce, to multiply, to grow through intimacy or through relationship. In fact, the number one purpose he gave man was to be fruitful and multiply. 
to actually grow. Multiplication has different uh, denotations or definitions to it. God requires, and this is a thing you can write down if you want, intimacy in order for things to multiply or grow. Intimacy is the solution to a lot of the pollution that we see relationally. The opposite of isolation is intimacy. So you see trees and plants, they have to cross-pollinate. You see animals, they have to mate. You see man and woman, they have to marry, or they should, okay? And if you see the more intimate that you see between those two people, if you see the intimacy between a man and a woman, uh, you'll, the more they multiply. My wife and I contributed greatly to that. <laughs> Four kids. So, so but, but it's beyond, and I want you to see it in principle, it's beyond physical multiplication, it's also a spiritual multiplication. And, and so, so generational blessings are a result of things being passed down, values and certain information that's been transferred and, and imparted. Not, not, it's been caught, not just taught, through intimate relationship. The same is true of bad things. Some things bad, generational curses are passed down through relationships. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So there needs to be an intentionality about it or we will unintentionally have the wrong results or the wrong. Uh, outcomes. Enter Satan in the Genesis account. When Satan shows up with the first family on the scene, he shows up and he doesn't tempt humanity with evils and big nasty sins. Ultimately, at the core of what he's trying to do is he's just, he has the specific goal of just getting between man and God and getting between uh, husband and wife. Satan's goal was to breach or break apart or divide or, or do everything he could to stop intimacy. Is everybody tracking with me? And so he gets in the middle of a relationship and he messes it up. And that's what Satan has been doing all through society at the core level is to stop intimacy because with intimacy, people and things grow. And I don't want to get overly controversial. I don't know what your view is on this, but I'm just saying if you even look at abortion, it's Satan's agenda to get between a mother and a baby. If you look at uh, uh, pornography, it's just Satan's agenda to get between a husband and a wife and a wife with a husband. If you look at divorce, it's just Satan's agenda to get between uh, the, 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 the goal of marriage. He doesn't hate divorcees. He just hates what happens. It hurts children. It hurts generations. It hurts people. It's just the enemy's attempt to stop into intimacy from taking place because if he can then nothing will grow amen so God warned us all throughout the scriptures if you can mess up the seed if you can mess up the the intimate DNA that he has for us the potential is in that seed of intimacy if he can mess that up you can mess up the whole earth literally all living things can be messed up if you can mess it up at that level and so the enemy, he creates this issue over and over again, different issues. All of the issues that you see are to try to breach intimacy. And relational wounds will keep you from your blessing. And the devil hasn't stolen your blessing. What he's actually done is he's gotten in the middle of the process that leads to your blessing. He's just trying to stop the journey, stop the process. Now, the good news is Jesus has come and he has restored uh, that which has been broken. He has, he, has, he, has, he has taken the barrier between God and man, the wall of hostility, it says in Ephesians 2.18, and he's joined man and God together. So we have the opportunity to be in right standing with God. That's been restored by faith through Christ. Can I have an amen? amen. So that can happen by faith through Christ in a second, in a moment. You can have that relationship restored. You can have a new nature in Christ Jesus. But conforming and living under the jurisdiction of that nature is a process in a journey that takes place in relationship. And so God never meant for us to just be me and God. It was me and God with and worked out amongst people. That's what he's been doing for centuries. In fact, when he left this earth after restoring humanity back to God the Father, he said, I want you to go in all the world, and I want you to multiply. I want you to grow. I want you to make disciples. And so I want you to teach these things. I want you to transfer these things. I want you to impart these things. I want you to be in intimate relationships like I was with you, disciples, like I was with the 12, with the three, and with the one. I want you to have intimacy. And through that intimacy that he had with those 12, he changed the world. And through intimacy that you can have with somebody else, you can change your world and the world around you. Amen? So there's these stages to intimacy. And I kind of want to try to give you a window of what that looks like. And that's why this is up on the stage, in case anybody's wondering, okay? 
So I'm going to give you the opportunity, when I was in counseling, my wife and I do marriage counseling from time to time, give it and receive it because it keeps us healthy. But there's this term, it's called intimacy. When you think intimacy, it's an opportunity to look inside and see, how am I doing? Am I going and growing? Am I growing deeper or am I staying in the same stage and place in my relationship with God and with others? And so this window kind of reflects different stages of relationship. Boom. Isn't that powerful? <laughs> it's like, what? Hey. Um, so here's what's going on. I want you to think of like four window panes in your relationship with yourself and with others. Okay. The first a window pane up here, upper left, is the public self or the arena. This is the part I know and you know, okay? Right now, I'm operating in the public self. This is the part that I let you see. This is the part, the best part of me, hopefully, other than last week when you guys took something I said and put it all over social media where I messed up. That's not so fun. Some of you know what I'm talking about. How many of you saw that clip online, okay? Yeah, I was praying in tongues publicly. Okay. So that's the part you know and I know. This is like the surface side of who you are. This is the, it's protected though, it's guarded. Most are comfortable to stay in this public arena, this, this public self. But yet the Bible tells us to share our lives, to open up, to be, kind of be real. And sometimes we're not. So we need to move from that place. We can't live there. So the next place is the mask. Everybody say the mask. Yes. This is the part that I know, but you don't know. And there's a part of me that's behind a mask that I know, and I ain't let, me, let you guys going to see, certainly not in this arena, all right? But there's a part of me that I know that somebody needs to know. In other words, if we live behind our mask too long, we, start, we, stop forgetting, we start forgetting who we really are. If we live behind a mask the rest of our lives, we could be in a very, very dangerous place because that's the part of us where there are secrets, and we all have them. We all have secrets. And you're in trouble if you're the only one who knows them. You're in trouble if you're the only one who knows your secrets. You'll always be as sick as your secrets. You might want to write that down. You always will be as sick as your secrets. And so God has a response to that default to live behind the mask. It's confession. It's kind of transparency. It's vulnerability. In fact, Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper or you don't grow. You don't reproduce yourself. You don't multiply because you're holding it in. But the one who confesses and renounces them, finds mercy. So you can get your, you can confess to God and find forgiveness, but in order to work it out and make it go away, you gotta confess to somebody else. And see, religion gets this wrong and thinks there's only one person that can help you. And so that's not the case. Actually, you can be in community, in safe and trusted relationships. James 5 tells us, confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. God wants you to get over those lies that the enemy puts in your heart. He doesn't want you to be preoccupied with guarding your reputation and not letting people see the real you. It can, it can, it can literally destroy you. God loves you. Loves and is attracted to honesty, not perfection. He's attracted to honesty and not perfection. Here's the third window pane. This is the blind self. Everybody say blind self. <laughs> this is the part that you know, but I don't know. I will never see the backside of my head, but you guys can. Somebody can see the, somebody can point out something that I cannot see on my own. We all have a blind spot. And this is what keeps us from moving forward to true intimacy, to growing deeper in relationship with God and with others. Blind spots can be sometimes rather egregious. It can be like, it's like, praise the Lord, somebody's calling me. Blind, spot, blind spots can be like body odor, okay? Like everybody knows except you. Blind spots is like a booger at the end of your nose. It's like spinach in your teeth. It's like when your fly's down and you don't know. Makes me think real quick. I should check. Okay, I'm good. All right. So everybody has blind spots. We need people in our life that help us. And I'm amazed how many people never get to this phase in their life. They don't, they don't have a friend that can tell them. And so what happens is they get to places of pain, rejection, uh, unfortunate mistakes and circumstances because nobody can tell them. I call it American Idol disease. How did you get on national television auditioning and nobody told you you couldn't sing? Like, where were your friends? My father used to always say, you know, love will tell you your breath stinks. Step back, get a Tic Tac. Okay, that's a friend, right? That's why we can't be the only set of eyes that we have. All of us should be the last person we ask for advice from. 
because our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. We don't see things as they, as they really are. We see things as we are, and so we need other people to help us with this. Amen? Yeah. So we've got to have stages that we go through. If we go through these stages of relationship in the context of safe relationships, it leads to what's called the potential arena. This is, this is the secret sauce. This is where things begin to explode. This is the supernatural part of your life. Basically, uh, what happens here is if you'll go through this process, this is the part that I don't know, you don't know, only God knows. This is the potential. This is the transformational part of our life. This is where God wants to do something great. God has designed it that you would get to a place where there's intimacy, there's transparency, there's vulnerability, and all of a sudden in this arena of relationship, when you get in a group, that's the starting point, not the end point, but at some point in that journey, you're going to get to a place where your purpose is revealed, where you work through that thing that you've never been able to get over in your entire life, your identity, some rejection, some past hurt or pain, some addiction in your life it happens here is everybody tracking with me and that's what we want for you we want you to get in a community where that can be possible but you have to take a step you have to move from one place to another incrementally making these investments in your life can i have an amen, amen. so i want to show you something i want to we're just going to give you one small picture of what happens in a small group with two super real people who are funny and colorful whose lives were changed in just one category i just want you to see this is like a scratch a snapshot of what can happen in a lot of different ways in your life check out this video and we'll be back to talk to you in just a second look at this All right, look, I'm way big. If I set I up know. straight, it'd be like well, this. And then I'd be here. Now you look like a little person. I so am I'm a little stay person. I'm going to stay I'm fine with my consistent. size. Thank you. All right. Talk to the people. I am. Me and the people. Ayana and I met in college when we were both 19. So we were both young and had more student loan than common sense, but don't most college students? We both grew up in middle class families with little uh, financial guidance or awareness, so to speak of. But we both knew we needed money to realize our dreams um, and, and to seize them. So to make our dream a reality, for the next eight years, we went to work. Eric graduated with his bachelor's. I graduated from pharmacy school and became a pharmacist. We got married. Then Eric got his PhD. And collectively, I mean, we accumulated over $100,000 for our respective educational journey. And by this time, we bought into the idea that as long as we had a six month emergency fund and that student loan debt was good debt, we were all good. So we just dived right into what we thought was our American dream. We bought cars, we went on trips whenever and wherever we wanted. The mall became my favorite place to unwind. I never met a sale I didn't like. Life was good. Then baby girl number one arrived and I didn't have a job. My postdoc had just ended. Unfortunately, I was unemployed for a few months, you know, as a doctor, go figure. Uh, but nevertheless, a few months later, I landed the job that my heart desired. And then about a year later, baby girl number two and three came, twin girls, and I was able to do the job of my heart's desire. I became a stay-at-home mom. Yeah, now see, from a man's perspective, that's a lot of weight. And I went from being a full-time pharmacist to part-time pharmacist to PRN, AKA working randomly. So we were definitely taking a hit there with uh, the twins' pregnancy coming along into the picture. But nevertheless, you know, we had to make those adjustments and uh, it doesn't matter. You know, I think you can be as responsible as you want in life, but sometimes life just happens. Then one day while at church, we heard promotions about the upcoming small groups and more specifically, Financial Peace University. I was intrigued by the testimonies and also because I consider myself the CFO of the whole household, the chief financial officer and handle all the day-to-day -day finances. It sounded right up my alley. You know, as the CEO of the Hall family household, I authorize resources to experience FPU. But seriously, FPU was life-changing. We learned that no debt is good debt. And most importantly, we learned how to communicate in our marriage. We went from talking about money when we had an issue to having ongoing money talks and a monthly budget meeting. And in FPU, the hardest part for me was paying down a student loan debt. 
not because I didn't think we could do it, but because it meant getting rid of my six month emergency fund down to a thousand dollars. And as a woman and a wife, that was really hard for me because it was like taking my security. But through FPU, I learned that money is just a thing and that God provides my security and all our needs. I think almost a year later, we had completely uh, eliminated our remaining student loan debt as well as replaced our you know, six month emergency fund that we lost. So to God be the glory Amen. on that. Meets by the pound. I think really kind of the key takeaways for me were just essentially becoming very disciplined and understanding what the word says about stewardship and being able to kind of find that financial peace or freedom, so to speak, in the midst of that journey. And I think even through that, what we learned is like, you can still live life to the full, you know, within your means, I mean, you definitely have to scale back and be disciplined in some of your activities, but we weren't eating rice and beans every night. And I think that, you know, ultimately for me, that was probably the biggest takeaway is like, just to be able to realize what you can do if you live within your means. And although we took FPU a few years ago, it's still a major part of our everyday lives. I still use the monthly budget flow sheet to do our monthly budget, and I still use the envelope system to take care of the everyday needs. And in our envelope system is our monthly allowance. And for most people, they'd be like, aren't you too old to have a monthly allowance? And our answer is no. no. It allows us to do what we want to do. I can go get my nails done or buy a pair of shoes and still stay within budget. So stewardship remains key. Yeah, we really welcome the opportunity to share our experience and our financial journey through FPU. Uh, to encourage others to explore this ministry and if you've taken it before to remind you that if you follow the steps, it really does work. Um, and we really look ahead and look forward to greater financial freedom to be a blessing to others.